So God has given me a desire to help that person, to help you believe that you can change the world exactly where you are. And how do you help people believe that? Well, it takes time. It's a process. And it's got to be something a person's willing to go down. I mean, they've got to say, okay, you're saying that I can change the world. You're saying that I can make a difference. But there were 12 men that had to make a decision to walk with Jesus and find out what he meant when he said, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. They had to be willing to lay some stuff down and be willing to follow him to understand, okay, what does this mean to change the world? How am I going to reach the potential that you say that I have? I mean, that's a big question. So I just want to help the common guy believe he can change the world and show him how to do it. Now, there's a reason a couple weeks ago, I'm sure it'll probably be hit way more than any message I've preached, and that's cool, that's fine, so be it. If that's how God wants to use it, so be it. But there was a guy here two weeks ago. His name's Bill Carrier. Um, he's just a unique guy that God's crossed my paths with, and he works every day for Coca-Cola just like you do. Matter of fact, his schedule's constantly changing. In other words, one day he'll have to go into work at, at 5 o'clock. The next week it might be 8 o'clock. The next it might be 10, and it just changes all the time. But he has a job just like you do. He has, matter of fact, I think he has five or six kids does anybody remember? Bill has five or six kids um, that several of them are still in his house, and yet would you truly believe that he's the kind of guy that is impacting the world? Would you believe that by just seeing him? He's never been to seminary one day of his life. Can he impact the world? I want people to believe that. I want people to believe that you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to go to seminary for years to, 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 to become equipped to make a difference in the world. You don't have to do that. I'm not against it, but you don't have to do it. Because some of you couldn't go if you wanted to. You got too many kids running around. You got to provide for your family. You couldn't do that. So how does that guy impact the world? One of the interesting questions that I asked Bill the other day was, Bill, Tell me something, man. You've been at this for 12 years. Just training people that God brings your way. I said, so how many have you got out there that you know of that you've trained and that are actually doing what you're doing? And so he started thinking about it a little bit. And then he came back and he said, well, I at least know of five and maybe six. And that's all he said. And then about 10 minutes into the conversation, he said, but you know, Matt, the last time that I heard from one of those guys, he was in Brazil somewhere trying to plant a church with some Brazilians. Now think about that. Here's a guy who works every day with Coca-Cola. He's never been to seminary, and yet he's impacting the world. Would you agree? It's kind of funny with Bill because Bill has a relationship with a friend of mine named Derek Jones. He's been here. He's preached. You guys know him. And, and 12 years ago, 12 years ago, Derek, who already knew Bill and some of these other guys, started asking me some really interesting questions about where I was in my ministry. I mean, some really neat questions. And so what God used these questions to do for me was to begin to, to cause me to think about, all right, you, you, you've built this and you've got these people, they're showing up and all this stuff, but, but what God used those questions to do in my life was to ask the question, what is all of this that, that I'm doing? What is it really producing? And so I began to really think about that. What, is, what, what kind of people are we spitting out of this thing that we have here? And so... Here I am. Here I am, some questions 12 years ago, and, and here I am at this point. It's really mind-boggling to me, but I really have a desire to help the everyday kind of person believe that he can impact the world. The 
And so how do we, how can we do that? How can the body of Christ reach the world? How can we do it? Well, you know, sometimes the mindset can be, well, let's just go out here and hold all these big meetings and let's see how many thousands of people that we can get to come to the meetings so that we can preach the gospel to them and, and get them saved and so forth and so on. And, you know, we think about it on that kind of scale a lot of times. We think about reaching out to the world. But here's, here's what God has shown me, guys. How does the church of Jesus Christ reach the world? We reach the world by each of us reaching and being faithful to the ones that God gives us. Does that make sense? Are you tracking me? I mean, think about that. We are able to reach the world by being faithful to reaching the ones that God gives us. Now again, let's back up. You're God, man. He's got the very thing that the world needs, all right? I mean, he's got the life that we who are living in death, he's got exactly what the world needs. How does he get it to them? How does he do it? One guy. Anybody know his name? Come on, man. I know y'all from Bandy's area or some of you have lived here for a while and it's rubbing off on you, but you're okay. Who was that guy? What was his name? Jesus. There we go. Right. So here's God. How's he going to get the, to the world? How's he going to reach him? How's he going to get life to him? He sends one guy. His name is Jesus, right? Now, if you track along through Scripture, you'll find out that the Father gave this one guy 12 guys. John 17 is a perfect place. Jesus referred to them as the men that you, speaking to his Father, these are the men that you gave to me. So Jesus, all right, one, he pours everything he has, every bit of life he has, everything the Father's ever said to him, he pours it into those men. And you've got to understand, we forget the fact that Jesus grew up just like you and I did. He learned just like you and I did. So he, he grew to know his Father as he lived on this earth. He grew to understand how to hear from his Father. He grew to understand faith just like you and I grow to understand it. He just did it all perfectly. And so his father gave him 12 guys, and so Jesus took those 12 men, and everything the father gave him, he poured into those men. And then he tells those guys that when I'm out of here, I want you to go and do the same thing for others. Now I want you to think about this. You and I are sitting here today because those 12 men chose to go and do for other people what Jesus Christ did for each of them. And see, I'm just worried a little bit. Don't mean to be mean. I'm just worried as to how much the gospel really means to the church of Jesus Christ because here's what I'm thinking. And man, you talk about a, a, a heart-penetrating question that God asked me is if the gospel means so much to you, Matt Rummage, then when you're dead and gone, I want to know how many people are going to be left behind that you have built, that you have trained to share this message with the rest of the world. Man, that's a challenging question. Because we assume, because we're showing up in the building every week and we're doing the church thing, we're assuming that it's happening. But a lot of times what's happening is people get sort of lost in the cracks and, and we don't uh, have the mindset that we meet people where they are and take them from where they're at along to where God wants them to be. So, it all started with one and because of those that Jesus invested his life in, because of their faithfulness to do for others what Jesus did in their lives, you and I are sitting here today. So what does the future look like for us? Because at the end of the day, we say this all the time, well, God's called us to save souls. But the reality is God said to his disciples, go make disciples, right? That's what he said. He didn't just say, go get people saved. He said, go make disciples. So in other words, when somebody becomes a Christian, they're born again, right? They begin a new life. And so at some point, they have to be taken under somebody's wings and helped to grow to the point that they can actually go and live on their own and do things 
on their own as well. So you've heard me say these things over and over and over again. But here's the thing. You can impact the world if you do it God's way. A couple of weeks ago, I was sharing with you how I went and looked back and how we started in 2015 talking about the potential we have and all those different things. And So anyway, it's interesting to go look back at all those messages and all those sermons that I preached and what I found is a very unique pattern. I've never done this before. But I'm just like, I wonder if there is a pattern to what God is saying because I always say to you guys, what you get on Sundays is what God's sharing with me through the week. That's just what you get. So is there any pattern to this? So we started out talking about potential in 2015. And so what I found as I've looked back at those old messages is that there's a consistency, and that consistency is that God was showing us through all of those messages how it is that you and I are capable of reaching that potential. So a couple weeks ago, I talked about the importance of grace. And when you talk about impacting the world, ladies and gentlemen, people look at you and they say, man, I'm not worthy of a task such as that. I mean, who am I, man? I got so many problems going on in my life. I got this, I got that, I got everything going on, and all this stuff is keeping me from this or that. So what makes it possible for somebody in that kind of situation to be able to impact the world? Grace, right? Right? Because what does grace say? Grace says that you are worthy. Grace says that you are worthy through Jesus Christ. Amen? So there's nobody here today that is unworthy of such a task to impact the world. Okay? Nobody. Grace makes that possible. The second thing is his life. Now, I don't know if you truly believe this, but I believe that when a person becomes a Christian, Okay? When they become a child of God, that they actually receive God's life into them. Matter of fact, Paul says it over and over again this way. He says that you believers, you are the temple of God. You are the very place where God's presence resides. So grace says you're worthy through Christ. His life says that you're capable of such a task. Because it's easy for us to look at ourselves and say, man, I don't, kinda, I don't have that kind of ability. Talking about being a a world changer? I'm not capable of such a thing. And the truth is you're not. But guess what? He is. Y'all smile at me for one second. I I promise you I will hurry, but somebody's got to smile quick and act like you're agreeing and hearing what I'm saying or something. Okay? Thank you. So you want to be a world impact or somebody that makes a difference you're going to have to receive grace you're going to have to realize your worthiness doesn't come from your performance but your worthiness comes from Jesus Christ okay but not only that you're going to have to embrace the reality that God lives in you And it's not your ability that makes you a world changer. It's his ability in you and through you that makes you have that kind of potential. Now, now, I mean, I'm saying that, but I'm just wondering, do you believe that? Because that's the bottom line. Because I can sit up here and I can teach and talk and all day long, but if you don't say that and believe that, you'll never make a difference. You'll always be looking for everybody else to do it. But there's something else that I want to talk to you about real quick from James chapter 1, and we'll do this over a series of weeks. We'll never cover it all today. But one of the things, you know, yet yeah, grace has a big role. Embracing God's life in you has a big role to all this. But reaching your potential also has something to do with you learning how to listen. Amen? You being able to reach your potential to impact the world has everything to do with you developing ability to listen to the voice of God. Let me tell you what Jesus says real quick from John chapter 10. I just thought of this, so give me a second. 
Listen to John chapter 10. Verse 27 says this, My sheep, Jesus speaking, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Now listen to that again. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. You will find it interesting. For the last two and a half years, you, you might would think, well, why didn't you do this earlier? But for the last two and, a, two and a half years, I have been trying on my own to read a lot in the Gospels, studying very specifically the life of Jesus Christ and very specifically how he lived out his relationship with the Father because he is the model of it. He's the model of what God resurrected you to. He is the model of what God has redeemed you into, ladies and gentlemen. That relationship. So he shows us how the Father desires to see that lived out in us. And what you will find is that everything Jesus was saying, he was saying it because he was hearing the Father say it. Does that make sense? In other words, he wasn't speaking unless he was hearing the Father saying it, and so he spoke those words. But not only that, the Bible says he wasn't even doing anything unless he was seeing the Father working there and doing it. So his life was all about saying what God said. His life was always about being on the same page with where his father was. What about you? Because here's the deal. You can't go over here and play and beg God to come over here and best bless what you think you're supposed to be doing in this life. God doesn't work that way. If you don't believe me, just read your Bible. Just read about all the times that God's people said, I'm just going to go do this, and I'm going to expect God to bless it. How well did that work for them? All you got to do is read it. That's why you'll find in Scripture there's this phrase used over and over again. It talks about how people inquired of the Lord. What does the word inquire mean? It means to ask over and over. Over and over. It says they did inquire of the Lord or they didn't inquire of the Lord. When they didn't inquire of the Lord, guess what? Trouble. <laughs> when they did inquire of the Lord, good. So grace is important. His life in us is important. But we also got to learn how to hear and how to listen to his voice. Have you ever been in a place in life you just thought, well, was that God? Was that God really saying that? Or was that something else? So you see, we're not going to cover this in one message. Matter of fact, it's not even going to be accomplished in this group. It's not going to be accomplished in this setting. It has to be a desire of your heart to say, God, I really want to know how to hear your voice. Because for years, if I can be honest with you, I'm a little ashamed of this, but for years I've just kind of done what I thought I needed to do. I didn't realize you could have that kind of intimacy with God. I didn't realize, because I just always believe, well, God speaks through His Word, and yes, He does. And we can rely on that. But the idea that God would speak to me in my everyday life and say, hey, speak this, do that, go here, do this, I didn't think that that was possible. But let me ask you something it was possible with Jesus then why is it not possible with you and me if he's the model of what we've been resurrected and redeemed into then why is it not possible it is possible right but why do we shut down a lot of times oh my goodness if I really get serious about listening to God then he just might call me to Africa he just might call me to the backwoods jungles of somewhere that I will have to eat animals and have to eat insects all the time and, and run around wearing leaves as clothes or some kind of mess. I don't know. But is that not true? Are we not to some degree a little bit scared that if we get serious about listening to God of what he might tell us to do? But I hate to tell you this, but what I've realized in my own life is that that really is sad when I'm like that because that, that says more about what I believe about my father. And it's almost like I have this idea, or most people have this idea that their father's just this mean guy that wants to put them in these horrible situations to see just how really committed you are to me, you know. 
Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So let's look at James chapter 1 real quick, and we'll just kind of read these verses, and then we'll, we'll go. And, but you can have something to look into a little bit later on and study throughout the week, okay? Let's start reading at verse number 12. It says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, because when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted that I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Now look at verse 16, okay? So obviously James does not want people to go down the path that leads to death, right? He doesn't want that to happen. So what does he say to him in verse 16? Look at what he says. He says, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Let me ask you a question. Who do you think is behind this effort to try to deceive and mislead God's people. Who do you think is behind that movement? Obama? See, that's what some of you think. And that's why you run around mad all the time about government. I'm telling you, Obama's not the problem. Satan is the problem. And the problem is the people who allow themselves to be puppets in the hand of Satan. Amen? That's the problem. So if you want to understand where the real evil and the real filth and the real nastiness is coming from, his name is Satan. That's who your adversary is. We're told to pray for our leaders, by the way. That may be hard for you, but maybe it's something you need to swallow a little bit of your pride and begin to pray that maybe God would open his eyes. I'm going to tell you, you can do a lot more, accomplish a lot more than that than just sitting around talking bad about it, right? And I'm not saying it's not bad, okay? <laughs> but it just shows you what happens when Satan gets in control of things. So, James doesn't want people going down that path. Now, do you understand this about James? Who are we talking about with James here? Do you guys know who James is? Who? Yeah. Half-brother, technically. But he's a guy, that, think about this. He had an opportunity to grow up in the house of God in the flesh. So think about that. He's in the home of God in the flesh, and so he had the opportunity to hear God speak. But do you realize if you study out the life of James that James did not become a believer until after the resurrection? And you're saying, where are you going with this, preacher? Here's where I'm going with it. He had plenty of opportunity to listen and hear what God was saying. But guess what? He didn't. And so why do you think he's so passionate? Because now he gets it. Now he understands who his half-brother is. Now he understands what grace is all about. Now he understands who the Messiah really is and what his plan was for James' life. And so he gets it. And now he's, he's writing to these believers that he knows are being misled and deceived, and he's pleading with them through this letter, saying, don't let it happen. You see, temptation doesn't come from God. If you'll notice in the text, and we'll talk about this more in depth as we walk through, but James tells you how sin conceives, and he compares it to the idea of conception. And we'll talk about this later. But it's the enemy who is sowing these seeds of deceit and deception, sowing these lies, these seeds of these lies into your life. Because the Bible says you're, 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 you're led down this path of sin when you're enticed and drawn away by your own desires. Ladies and gentlemen, God has put the desires that you have in you. Okay? 
But what the enemy's goal to do in your life is to get you to fulfill those desires in an ungodly way. Does that make sense? So how does he do that? He does that by lying to us. He does that by deceiving us. So what's the only way that we can overcome the lie? The truth. So look what James says. He says, don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. And then he says in verse 17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now look at verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, what does he say? Be swift, or better yet, be quick to what? Hear. Be quick to hear. Now, instead of listening, what do we have a tendency to do? Look what James says. He tells them, be quick to hear, slow to. He says, be quick to hear, slow to. Speak. So what's one of the things that Matt Rummage struggles with instead of listening? I want to talk. And it may not necessarily be talking to somebody. I don't know. My kids tell me all the time, Dad, you're weird. Every time I see you, it's like you're talking to yourself. Who in the world are you talking to? I'm, I'm weird. I'm talking to myself. You know? Because think about, again, the context. Go home, read all of chapter 1. This is in the context of talking about trials. And James is saying to believers, I want you to rejoice no matter what kind of trial you fall into because I want you to understand Daddy's good. Daddy's awesome. Daddy's wonderful. And he's using these trials for your own good to build up your character in Christ. He's saying, but he understands the reality that in the midst of your trials, that where God's trying to do something good, I'm telling you the enemy's lurking. And where God's trying to do something good, the enemy's there to try to do something evil. So don't be deceived. So how do you avoid being deceived? You've got to be quick to hear. Excuse my vernacular, but some of you need to learn how to hush. Because if you're not talking to yourself, Matt, you're talking to somebody else trying to figure out how you're going to fix it. Figure out how you're going to make what you want happen. And the problem with that is, is that when I'm talking, I'm not listening. Do you realize, here's something I've learned. I have learned, and I shared this with the deacons this morning, I have learned that physically, it can be absolute chaos. I, I mean, you could be, I mean, you think about a loud place. And God can speak, and you can hear him just like that. But then again, you can be in a place where it is as still and as quiet as it is out here at nighttime, because there's nobody going down the road, and that's one of my favorite times, to just lay there in the bed and just enjoy the quietness. But do you realize that sometimes when it is physically the quietest, that I can't hear God at all. You know why? Because there's noise up here. Why is there noise? Because I'm too busy talking. I'm too busy trying to figure it out. I'm too busy trying to think of a plan on how I'm going to fix my situation or fix this or fix that or figure it out. And listen again, if I'm doing that, I can't hear. It's noise. So he says, be quick to hear Slow to speak, and then what else? Oh, here's a good one. Not only slow to speak, but slow to, to wrath. Now, why is he saying that? Because I'm going to tell you something, folks. When life squeezes on you, when life squeezes on you through whatever means it is, it has a tendency to get us really upset. Can I get an amen? Amen. I mean, I don't know about you, but 
That's tough. And so remember, James is talking about trials. He knows God's up to something good in your life, but he also knows that the enemy's lurking. And he's trying to turn that thing into evil. He's trying to take your trial and turn it into a temptation for you to sin. He's sowing these seeds of doubt, sowing these seeds of these deceit into your life. So it's easy to get upset. But can I tell you why you shouldn't get upset? Look at it. Next verse. Verse 20. What does verse 20 say? Because guess what about your anger, ladies and gentlemen? It's never going to produce what's right. And that's what that means. It's never going to produce what God longs to see, and that's his righteousness be produced in our lives. So you can get mad all you want. You can get frustrated. You can preach here. You can preach there. You can get mad, and you can say all these things, but the reality of your anger is it's never going to lead you to the ultimate goal. Amen? So, you know, at some point in our lives, at some point in our lives, all of us, and I know it's not just a one-time thing. It's an every-moment thing. That we in those moments have to embrace the most important thing in these moments is to listen. It's not to talk. It's not to get upset because neither of those things are going to get us to the ultimate goal. So here it is, and I'm, I'm done with this, and we'll talk about it more later. Look at verse 21. Therefore, okay, therefore, here's what you've got to be willing to do. You've got to lay aside all the filthiness. You've got to lay aside all the wickedness. Right? So as this stuff's coming, the enemy's trying to bring all this stuff on you, all this filthiness, all this wickedness. Now what's interesting about the word filthiness is that it could be translated earwax. And I think that's interesting in light of James' plea with the people of God to listen. Don't you? So it's almost like the enemy would just love to fill your spiritual ears with wax to keep you from hearing from God. Do you see the impact of this? See, the enemy doesn't want you to hear from God because I'm telling you, the minute you start listening and the minute you start following him, God's going to start doing stuff through you that's going to flip everybody else out. That's why it was so important last week that you guys, whether you wanted it or not, you had to hear the story of the van. You had to hear it because that was not something that man concocted. That's what God did. And if people had not listened, if people had not been willing to put aside feelings and fear and just obey God, then listen, it would have never happened. Now there's a man. Now there's a man in Westlaco, Texas, who believes that he's loved, who believes that he's cared for, is more encouraged now than he's ever been in his whole life because somebody of believers in Cheryl's Ford, North Carolina, said, I just want to listen to God and let God work through my life to be a blessing to somebody else. And so now we're partnered with a guy who loves the world that we have the opportunity to speak through and impact the world in a place that I'm most likely nobody in this room will ever live. I don't want to live in Westlaco. Because <laughs> guess what? It's hot in Westlaco. All right? But I'm glad I can make a difference where I'm at. Therefore, you got to be willing to lay aside the junk. And I know there's a big question there. How do we discern what's junk and what's not? That's a good question. But we've got to be willing to lay it aside. And notice what it says, and receive with meekness. That is the word humility. Receive with humility the implanted word which is able to save your soul. That phrase had, had gotten me for a long time. I did not understand implanted word. But the word implanted means to be born inside. This is the only time in the Greek New Testament this word shows up. It's the only time. And it means to be born inside, to, to, to be born inward, okay? This word, the word is logos there for the word. There's, it talks about this implanted word. 
And we'll talk about this more in the future, but I believe it's James' way of talking about the Holy Spirit. Because what's born inside of a believer when you get saved is the Spirit of the living God. As Jesus said, the Spirit of truth. So how do we save our souls from the dangers of sin? How do we save ourselves from being led down that pathway that's going to lead us to hurt ourselves and other people? How do we avoid it? We've got to be willing to listen. And when he speaks, we've got to be willing to receive with humility the very word of the Holy Spirit of God that was put inside of us. Now, that word humility is very important there because, you know what? And I've, I've noticed this throughout my time. And this is, I'm afraid it's what's got so many congregations of believers in trouble. Is there comes a point when a lot of people, a lot of Christians, somehow get to believing that they know better than God knows. And so Christian, whenever you get to the point in your life when you stop seeking the heart of your Father in every matter that you deal with, you're going to be in big trouble. So you think at the end of this, what are we ultimately saying? Well, I want to see you impact the world. Grace is important. Grace is what makes you worthy through Christ for such a task. You've got to embrace his life in you because it's only his life that makes this possible. But the life he's put in you wants to lead you and guide you and talk to you. And so it's very important that if we want to impact the world, we learn to listen. Because God's not going to play on your field. He's not playing in your ways. He's going to do this the way he wants to do it. And at the end of the day, guess what? He's going to complete it. So the choice is either we're going to do our own thing or we're going to join up with God. I don't know about you, but I want to see you join with God. And that's why listening and hearing is so important. So let me ask you something. God's always speaking. So let me ask you, what's keeping you from hearing him? What are you facing? What are your challenges? And how are you dealing with it? Have you just took it into your father's lap and said, I mean, because you got access. I mean, you know, there's nothing hindering. you got access to just get right up in dad's lap and say, Dad, here it is. I'm laying it out. Here's my struggle. Talk to me. Show me. Show me what the next step is. And guess that? That's, what, that's all you're responsible for is one step at a time. But it's the kind of life I promise you that Jesus lived and it's the kind of life that you will live and impact the entire world. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather and open this book and read and study. and Lord, just to be encouraged with the fact that, Lord, this is not Matt's opinion of this group of believers, but it's yours. You said that your people, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. You're the one that has given grace. You're the one that has been willing to give your life. You're the one who is willing to teach us how to hear. You're the, will, you're the one that's willing to enable us to understand what the Father's voice is. And so as we learn that and as we grow deeper in our intimacy with you, Lord, we know when you're speaking. I mean, I know my dad's voice. My boys know my voice. They know it. They don't have to worry because they know it. And we know that the enemy is very good at trying to sound like you, but he's still not you. His goal is always stealing, killing, and destroying, and he will always be the father of lies. So, Father, may, may this be the beginning of a new path for us, a new path of a deeper, stronger, more intimate relationship with you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.